numbers uh, ahead. Right. Uh, so I think also I see people entering uh, the room. I also see that um, uh, the recording has been started. So maybe it's a good idea to start the webinar. Yeah, yeah, we can start. So you can lead, I just support. So that's fine. Great. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Um, Humnat, could you uh, let people inside the uh, meeting? Oh, you are not in the... Oh, sorry. Yeah, because I see sometimes people entering, but OK. Um, good morning and good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Very happy that uh, we are here today to learn together. Uh, these Delta talks have been uh, going on for quite a while, and we have been addressing a lot of very nice and interesting topics together. And today we will have um, Dr. Manjuran Mondal, from the International Rice Research Institute from Bangladesh. And he will be giving a very interesting presentation. The Dr. Mondal, are you there somewhere? Yeah, he's here. Yeah, okay. I, I'm available. Ah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see you in my screen. I have a lot of boxes in my screen. So are you ready to give a short introduction and uh, start your presentation? Uh, I think I can do that, but it should be introduction is given by uh, Dr. Vandani. That will be better. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll be happy to do do that one. No worries. Uh, hello, good day to everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar, this uh, Delta talk, the sixteenth in the series uh, for this year. And this is jointly organized by Asian Mega Delta and Wakindengen Agriculture University. And today we are fortunate to have uh, the presentation on drought, salinity, and water logging, which is more deleterious for sustainable intensification in the coastal zone of Bangladesh. And this will be presented by Dr. Monrandan Mandal. And many people. Know him, and he is very no, well known water scientist and uh, working in the coastal zone for more than three decades. And uh, he has vast knowledge and experience in the coastal zone in terms of uh, uh, water management for agriculture transformation. So we'll be hearing this interesting topic from Dr. Mandel. So uh, Dr. Mandel, the floor is over to you. And I guess hopefully you can finish around 25 minutes so that we have enough time for discussion. I'm sure there will be many questions uh, uh, for you to answer. So we would appreciate if you could finish around 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Over to okay. you. Okay, uh, thank you, Judith and uh, Bandari, uh, for a nice introduction. Uh, let me share my presentation. Yeah, we see your presentation and it's going well with sharing. Okay. okay. And can you go in? Okay. Okay. No. But we can see two slides. So if you go to two slides means the this corner, huh? Eh? Yeah. Okay. 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 Good. No. Good morning. Good Still afternoon. Not in the presentation mode, I guess. When they give the presentation mode, this oh, is coming. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, I think the previous one might be better. This one? Yeah. Okay. Mm, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this afternoon, uh, I will talk an interesting topic. Uh, drought, salinity, water logging. Which is more deleterious for sustainable intensification in the coastal polder zones of Bangladesh. We know, we all know that drought, salinity, and water logging, these three factors affects our productivity. But uh, which one is more deleterious for sustainable intensification in the coastal polder zone of Bangladesh? 
that I will present and I will discuss and uh, identify during my presentation uh, this afternoon. Now, let us give me a sub background of the coastal zone of Bangladesh. You know, Bangladesh is uh, almost self sufficient in rice, but the country faces enormous challenges to maintain food sufficiency due to natural calamities and adverse effects of climate change. The cropping intensity and productivity all over the Bangladesh is very high. There is little scope to further increase food production except the underutilized 3 million hectare coastal zone. You can see the coastal zone here in, in green. Uh, uh, and then uh, these are the uh, least productive zone of, of the country. The government constructed polders enclosing 1.2 million hectares. You can see the red circles, encircled red. These are the exterior coastal zone and encircled with polders uh, to uh, improve the productivity and make the land habitable for the uh, for the community. However, despite uh, the productivity of this zone, the coastal zone is very low, much lower than other parts of the country, despite significant investment from the government and a huge effort from different national and international organizations like our CD system. Then the question is, why the productivity is high? The question is why the productivity is high, despite huge, the uh, huge efforts from different corners. D did we miss any um, anything, or or, or we, we went with the wrong hypothesis, or inappropriate hypothesis for scaling the innovations? Because we have a lot of technologies. Other parts of Bangladesh are already adopted that. Why not in coastal zone? So that I will explain uh, 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 during my presentation. But unfortunate thing is that the coastal zone is rich with water resources, and uh, this can offer huge potential for Bangladesh to make a quantum leap in meeting future food security requirement of the country. So this is the uh, polder ecosystem. You can see here in, mid, uh, in the middle, this is a, a, a polder, uh, and the, 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 it's a landmass formed in between a spaghetti of rivers, and that landmass was enclosed by earthen embankment. You can see dotted line across this uh, uh, periphery of the land. And you can see that there are dotted uh, green dots that are called sluice gates. The sluice gates are, are constructed on, uh, on the polder embankment for water intake. You can see what in the high tide, for the water is uh, coming inside the polder and for drain out also in case of excess water. And the unique environment is that there is high and low tide uh, occurs in this environment twice daily. And, and, and then is offered, this is the land elevation around 1.5 meter. And the and high tide, the water level goes up to 3 meter above mean sea level. And during low tide, it goes close to sea level. So that means both irrigation and drainage are done by, can be done by the by gravity. So this is an interesting thing, need not to spend money for that. So this is a polder agriculture. In the wet season, spanning from July to December, all are rice. And you can see uh, mostly traditional rice are grown uh, by the farmers. And in the dry season, uh, some non -rice, uh, mostly non-rice crops are grown with low yielding and low input based on rice crop. And nowadays, due to effort of different organizations, the farmers started cultivating high value and high yielding dry season crops, despite 40% of the land remain fallow in this zone. You can see fallow lands, the cattle are grazing. Now, if we ask any person, what is the main challenge for agriculture development in the coastal zone? The common answer will be salinity. That means salinity is believed to be the main challenge for agricultural development in the coastal zone. Let us see the reality. Are we, uh, is this the reality uh, of that? Or uh, let's see that uh, the, the salinity of water and soil. You can see here, the in the south central region, this is the south central Borishal region, the uh, model predicted that 
that it, the region remains non-saline up to 2030. And in 2050, it will be moderately saline. And in Southwest region, it's a mixture of saline and fresh water. Now, coming to the soil salinity, about 75% of our land uh, is categorized as low and medium saline in the dry season, and 25% land is highly saline. Uh, but we have soil tolerant crops, and we know the management practices to tackle these soil salinity issues. Now, how high salinity is considered always a, 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 a curse. But if we think, just think out of the box, it can be a good, very good resource, a useful resource. How? In the dry season, the community can, the farmers can grow shrimp, and in the wet season, rice, fish, vegetables integration. And in very high saline area where rice, fish, vegetables cannot be grown, year-round agriculture can increase productivity, income, and nutrition, because the fish grown in the coastal zone are very nutritious. Now let us see the river water salinity, peak river water salinity in the current situation and, uh, and in future. Uh, IWM uh, developed this uh, uh, model and uh, using the uh, Bay of Bengal and Southwest Regional model to, to, to predict this salinity. And you can see here that in 2012, this is the benchmark year, there is no salinity in the southwest, uh, south central zone, Bodishal region, and there are salinity, high salinity, media, high to medium salinity in the south central, southwest zone that I explained earlier. In 2030, with the climate change scenario A on B, with 22 centimeter sea level rise, the, there is slight <laughs> salinity form. Uh, uh, increases uh, towards north in the southwest, and there are some salinity also came uh, in the south central Bodishal region. But the salinity is remained within one to five ppt. So five ppt near the coast and one ppt uh, in, uh, 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 inland. In 2030, uh, 2050, with a climate change scenario A2, with five millimeter sub subsidence, land subsidence, salinity level slightly increased, but major area will remain four to five PPT uh, in 2050. That means whatever the scenario uh, 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 are here in the in the southwest region, 2050 and beyond, almost similar scenario will prevail uh, in the south central region. Uh, this indicate that what we are doing research here in, in the south central region, uh, southwest region in Khulna uh, region now, the technology and management practices can be uh, replicated uh, in in the Bodishal region uh, in 20 uh, in uh, now and uh, and in 2050 onward. So <clears throat> this is the uh, let us uh, compare the real values uh, real value of uh, river water and then model predicted value. This is the scenario of 2030 that I explained on to five PPT. You can see this is the low saline zone, this is medium saline zone, this is a high saline zone in Shakti area. In the, and then you, uh, in 10 years before, in the low saline Bodishal region, the, the salinity of the Pyra River was uh, around uh, less than 5.5 decimal per meter. But 10 years after, it becomes close to 1.5, three times higher. But the same salinity, the, the uh, 10 years before, uh, although the dry soil salinity is increasing in the medium saline Kulna zone, but the peak is not that much increase. And you can see here, although the peak is increased in the medium saline zone, the in the wet season from July to December, uh, the salinity becomes less than one, 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 one decimal per meter. And in the high saline zone, the salinity goes up to uh, 30 decimal per meter. And in the wet, wet season, it is around uh, four to five years per meter. That means what model is predicting here is, is, is very close to the reality. Now coming to the soil salinity. This is the soil salinity in low saline zone, and this is in the medium saline zone. So you can see here the soil salinity in the west zone across the coastal zone varies from uh, is less than uh, four DS per meter. And in the dry zone, it varies from two to six DS per meter. Now, what is the effect of soil salinity 
on, on uh, drought means when there is no rainfall. You can see uh, this is a 2016-17 dry, dry season with slightly rainfall occurs here. And the, uh, we measured the salinity from 15 grid points of older 30 on of the boulder. And you can see salinity from January to uh, June, it remains within four DS per meter. But on the following year, it was a dry year, there was no rainfall. And then salinity increases more than eight DS per meter in many places in March, April, and May. That, it, that means soil salinity increases with drought, that is when there is no rainfall. I, 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 I mentioned drought as, as a part of rainfall. Lack of rainfall is, is drought here. And it reduces if there is a rainfall there. So rainfall distribution uh, uh, in the dry season plays a vital role in soil salinity uh, uh, dynamics. That means, but the, but the drought do not prevail all the time. You can see here, after drought, there is rainfall. So then the soil salinity becomes neutral or becomes less than two DS per meter in the month of June so that farmer can go for uh, improved technologies in the monsoon. Now, let's come to the wet season. This is the, the a, a medium saline zone. In the wet season, soil salinity less than four DS per meter and water salinity less than one DS per meter. That means salinity is not a problem for crop agriculture in the wet season. And this is the average rainfall for long-term rainfall varies from 250 to 600 millimeter. That means drought is not also a problem in the wet season. So then salinity and drought are not a problem in wet season agriculture. Then what is the problem? Problem is the excess water. You can see here in the during transplanting, the water is more than 50 centimeter. And even uh, so. HIV rice cannot be transplanted. And you can see here, this is one of our learning hub, eight hectare area, all transplanted to HIV rice. But before clinical initiation, there was heavy rainfall and crop was inundated. And the farmers could not apply nitrogen fertilizer and then produces lower yield. So then the excessive flooding or water logging is hindering the HIV rice cultivation in the wet season. Now coming to the dry season, this is low saline zone, and this is uh, in the low saline zone, salinity remains around uh, uh, six, four to six DS per meter, and uh, soil salinity and river salinity uh, less than 1.5 DS per meter. That means soil, uh, this salinity level does not pose any uh, threat to crop agriculture in the dry zone, in the low saline position region. Whereas in the medium saline zone, or high saline zone, it is the soil, both soil and water salinity are challenging. But soil salinity can be, can be neutralized if there is good quality irrigation water, but it is not available uh, in the medium saline coastal zone. So salinity uh, uh, is a problem in the medium saline coastal zone in dry season. Now, again, coming to this graph, the, the dry, uh, normal year and the dry year. You can see in the dry year, 2023, 22, 23, on, uh, there was no rainfall from first no November to end of March, and the crop suffered from water stress. That, that means salinity was also there. So drought and salinity uh, just reduce, it can reduce the crop yield. And you can see here, in, in the normal year, uh, uh, in the dry year, the yield of maize and sunflower significantly reduced uh, uh, in two, uh, 2017, 18, over 2016, 17. So the conclusion is that drought and salinity reduces the yield, but it seldom makes it zero. Now coming to the water logging environment situation in the dry season, you can see here in the 2016, there was heavy rainfall uh, in on February 25th, uh, and that in uh, around 90 millimeter rainfall, and that inundated the uh, crop field, dry season field. And with the drainage, uh, the sunflower crop recovered, but other crops was very small here, and that completely damaged. And you can see in the dry year, in the dry season 21-22, on the 5th February 2022, there was 70 millimeter rainfall that inundated the uh, crop, maize and sunflower, and completely damaged. So water logging in most cases produced zero yield, 
or minimum yield like on transpiratory um, uh, sunflower uh, when if the drainage is done on time. So this is a yield variability in the dry season from our uh, uh, decade long research. You can see the yield of maize and sunflower is not stable, it's variable in the dry season. And this maize yield varies from 1.5 to 10 tons per hectare, sunflower 0.5 to 3, around 4 tons per hectare. So why this variability is there? This variability causes because of the drought and salinity and water logging. These three, either solo or together. You can see here, this is the rainfall amount. Uh, and they, in the dry season, around 300 millimeter rainfall occurred. The red um, rainfall years, it produces water logging effect. And in the, uh, the, uh, the green ones produces supplemental irrigation effect. So you can question it, it less than 300 millimeter rainfall and 450 rainfall. How come? Because of the distribution. In this uh, 2018 and uh, this year, the rainfall, uh, a per day rainfall never exceeded uh, 30, 40 millimeter. But here, in this year, the red, red uh, years with red histogram, that rainfall uh, suddenly fall around 67 plus that damages the, but partly or fully the crops. That is the main reason for yield variability. So sustainable, uh, for in sustainable in intensification or variable uh, or sustainable yield uh, management or getting sustainable yield in the dry season, you have to manage drought, salinity, and not logging all three issues. Now, uh, you can see here, you can see here in the dry season, water logging hinders HIV rice cultivation. The constant is water logging and reduces the yield. In the dry season, I think uh, I need to give that slide uh, in more, the otherwise cannot be explained. Uh, so in the dry season, uh, drought and salinity, and uh, in the wet season, uh, in the uh, wet water logging, uh, also causing yield, yield, yield uh, uh, influencing yield. So drought, salinity, and water logging influence the yield of dry season crop. Whereas only water logging is uh, is hindering the yield of the wet season. Now let us give the proof of concept. As Dr. Bandari mentioned, that I have been working for a long time, so I will use uh, I will use the long long year uh, data uh, uh, for for this uh, uh, to prove this concept. So you can see here, the, the farmers used to open the sluice gate in the middle of July and shut down it in the second half of December. And they cultivate uh, wet season rice starting from August to January, December, January. Harvest is within, mostly harvest is within December. Then they allow the land to dry. And uh, when they dry, they plow the land and cultivate the dry season crop from February to May. But you can see here that mid-May, Second half of May is the start of the pre-monsoon and cyclonic season. Uh, in most cases, a, a low depression is formed in the Bay of Bengal, coinciding with the new and full moon in the second half of May, and uh, that causes rainfall. And de depending on the amount of rainfall, the, either the crop is either fully or partly damaged at or near the maturity. Let me give you some of the uh, show you some of the examples. So this is you can see the dry season is a very good sesame crop, and that crop was damaged by uh, rainfall on 25th of May. This is uh, a, a chili also damaged, and mung bean. And in the very recently 22, uh, the, the sunflower and, uh, and maize crop was damaged. And uh, this is the effect of drought. You can see a big drought. There is the uh, there is uh, crop growth is very stunted. So, but this will give some of the yield, not not zero yield. And this is a normal year. You, you will get very good yield without any irrigation. So, what is what we need? We need to. We cannot change this cyclonic pattern. This is the nature, reality, nature. So. We, 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 we cannot fight on, with the nature. So let us manage this nature. Can we ship this dry season crop a month earlier than, than to escape this, uh, the, the calamities? Yes, we can. But how to do that? We need to shorten this um, wet season rice 
by introducing high link variety in, in this season. That we have done, and I'll show you how we have done this. So this is the farmer's practice, a climate risk pattern. The productivity varies from two to seven tons per hectare per year. And we introduce this climate resilient varieties, high yielding varieties that can be harvested in November, within November. And this crop can be established a month later and be harvested within April. So April harvest is relatively safe, but in coastal zone, nothing is safe. It is very climate uh, uh, prone, risky area. So, but this is one of the way that we can uh, just minimize the or avoid the risk, not minimize the uh, risk. Now, why to introduce HYB? High link variety in wet season. This is the entry point. You can see here, a farmer is harvesting the <clears throat> crop uh, on uh, 12th November. But nearby farmers, all the traditional varieties not yet flower. It will take at least one month to mature. <coughs> Sorry. And you can see here, in one month after, this farmer is preparing for dry season crop. And still, the neighboring farmer's crop not yet harvested. And on in the third photo, you said that on the 31st of May, you can see the watermelon uh, is mature and other crops, he cultivated six, seven crops, and, and that all the crops are harvested within April. What, what we did? We uh, drain out water twice, open the sluice gate for nitrogen top dressing during low tides in the river. So this uh, introduction of uh, high yielding variety in the wet season not only gives higher yield, but it advance, it helps in advancing the cropping and early showing an early harvest of the dry season crop. Now, the, here is an example how we can establish the uh, dry season crop early. You can see this is the early established crop by dibbling. The farmers establish the crop by dibbling, manual dibbling. And when the soil, uh, at, uh, soil is at uh, saturated soil, and when the soil reached to a field capacity, the crop was around 15, 20 centimeter high, and the, uh, uh, the farmers broadcast the uh, fertilizer, and then pass a mini tiller in between to crop rows. That pulverizes the soil, incorporates this fertilizer and weed in, into the soil, and uh, due to plowing, the soil salinity to some extent reduces. And you can see here, this early established crop, at uh, end of February, the farmer's crop not yet germinated, but this crop at the vegetative stage. And the, crop, the farmer harvested the crop mid-April, whereas this traditional uh, practice they need on, uh, about one month more to harvest. And you can see here, the rainfall in the, in the uh, end of April and early May is, is high. So there is a heavy chance of crop damage. That is all, uh, almost happening every, every year in some part of the coastal zone of Bangladesh. So this, I designated this semi this mini tiller or garden tiller, people used to say that. This is one of the uh, game-changing machine for sustainable productivity in the dry season, in the coastal zone, under rain fed environment, where there is no source of irrigation water. This, uh, this is the summary slide. This is a nature-based solution for sustainable intensification and scaling options uh, uh, by, by a CA business model in the coastal zone of Bangladesh. The, the, this, or, this is the or three water management practice, the opening of the sluice gate and uh, uh, for, at the beginning of the season, then drain out water for top dressing and nitrogen, and then shut down, drain out and shut down this loose gate uh, when the rice is to mature before uh, mature and before harvest. And thus, this two crop based cropping pattern we have developed, and which could be harvested before the onset of the cyclonic season. And the, uh, by, by adopting this cluster farmer field school model. You can see here in the left corner, the model is there, involving the farmer, water management group, researchers, and extension personnel. This uh, model uh, and, and cultivate this crop in a cluster, in a watershed area, mini watershed area, not sporadic. Mm. Then the productivity in terms of rice equivalent yield can be achieved from nine to 13 tons per hectare per year. 
And this is called a relatively climate resilient cropping practice. Now you see, this is, this is a summary of the water environment, it's starting from July, August, September, October, November. All are full of water in the coastal zone. Even the, the crop was mature, uh, at harvest time it is muddy. So the mechanization is possible. But the approach we propose, the drain out water two weeks before harvest and shut down the sluice gate, that helps uh, in drying out of soil and harvest by machine. And even in the dry season, the, there is a chance of crop damage by rainfall induced water logging. So from this, we can summarize that the water logging is the constraints in the coastal zone of Bangladesh. And drainage is the key intervention needed for cropping system intensification. Then we have to revisit our challenges. Our, our hypothesis is that the salinity was the main challenge, but uh, uh, you can see here uh, the water logging in the wet season, even in the dry season. Uh, and uh, and then uh, this is the rainfall induced water logging that damages the crop or reduces the yield significantly. Of course, salinity and drought also influences yield, but the main culprit is is the uh, excess water that uh, that can that uh, in the wet season that hinders HIV rice adoption. And if you do not adopt or uh, cultivate HIV rice, your dry season crop will be will be will be under a stake uh, for crop damage due to cyclonic storm. Now, this is the last slide with the take home message that water logging is more deleterious than salinity and drought for sustainable intensification in the coastal polar zones of Bangladesh. It, this contradicts with our common belief that salinity is the main uh, hindrance for, for, for improved productivity and agriculture development in the coastal zone. And and we, devo we diverted all our efforts to tackle the salinity. And probably because of this unrealistic hypothesis or inappropriate hypothesis for a scaling, the a scaling of innovative agronomic innovations that in, in, in the country are, in, are limited in the coastal zone. I found this is the single most reason for non-adoption of improved technologies or less adoption of, I, I'll say, less adoption of improved technologies in the coastal zone of Bangladesh. Then what we need to do? The drainage. Drainage is the most key intervention in wet season and in also dry season to improve this productivity. And can we drain this uh, easily or do we need to money? No. The tidal dynamics of the coastal river system offer both drainage by gravity. And if we drain this land in the dry season, we can cultivate HIV rice. And that will not only double the productivity, it will also facilitate early establishment and safe harvest of dry, dry season crops in this most climate, level, climate vulnerable regions of the world. In the dry season, utilization of residual soil moisture and rainfall are the key for sustaining dry season productivity. And if we can manage these water resources intelligently and scaling agronomic innovations via CFFS model, the entire coastal zone can be brought under improved cultivation. And the productivity can be increased two to three times higher than farmers' practice. And that might contribute to meeting future food security requirement and is in achieving sustainable development goal on and to with minimum investment. With this, thank you very much for your patient sharing. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Manjuran. Uh, I think it was a very interesting presentation, so we learned a lot. So I'm for sorry. now, I would like to open the floor for questions or um, any reflections. I've seen that you have give, I see someone entering the room. Maybe I'll start also with a question from myself because I find it very interesting because we work also. Oh, I see here, Roy, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah, so my name is Dr. Devji Troy. I am from Bangladesh Rice Research Institute and I am working in Irrigation and Water Management Division. So it was a very nice presentation from Dr. Monaranjan as usual, it was very comprehensive. So I have a question, not a question actually, I want to know his comments about my asking that, uh, sir, you, you mentioned that drainage is the key feature in future for the Southern Coastal Zone. So what about the subsurface drainage? Do you, have, do you think it is prospectus for the uh, southern side of Bangladesh? Okay, thank you, Devjit, for your interesting question and a very scientific question. Uh, yes, uh, I have done a study in collaboration with the IMI, International Water Management Institute, uh, long ago. Uh, we installed subsurface drainage uh, uh, around uh, uh, six, millimeter six centimeter diapide but uh, because of this uh, muddy soil the, the it blocked hmm. and uh, and it cannot be done in everywhere because you need some uh, outfall to 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 fall that civil uh, water uh, through that pipe but it is possible uh, it is not uh, impossible but it is a uh, challenging and also very expensive yeah sir i saw that paper actually in 2016 you published in irrigation and drainage journal so, but uh, you, you you actually mentioned those con uh, challenges there in this paper. But by, by uh, beside this, don't you think it's still possible or it's, it's still prospectus? They still have prospectus for the southern zone. Yeah, it is a prospect, says, but you can see uh, uh, surface drainage is also possible. So when when surface drainage is possible without uh, incurring that much cost. Why should you invest on that? But there are some ways, there are some places where surface drainage is not possible. I believe that uh, the drainage, uh, a subsurface drainage could be uh, useful in that area. Yeah, thank you, sir. Great, very interesting question about subsurface drainage being a possibility. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, maybe I go ahead and also ask a question because we see indeed uh, you have been producing a lot of very interesting results. Have these results also been incorporated in publications or in uh, reports or uh, are you sharing these in events or? Yeah, uh, thank you, Judith. Uh, yes, so, uh, since you know, uh, Dr. Bhandar mentioned that I have been working here long. We have we published um, uh, in many journals and okay. presented in different seminars and workshops, uh, yes. uh, highlighting these uh, issues. Of course, yeah. uh, I came to this conclusion not only for instantly, it's a long experience uh, of working there. So uh, uh, I, I, I published that and, and presented yeah. in many workshops and seminars. Okay. And are you also, what is your plan for your follow-up research? So what would you look at next? I, I think, uh, the the, the uh, cluster based farmer field school model that we have developed uh, mm. uh, 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 since uh, you are familiar with the folder uh, you know yeah. that uh, yeah, yeah so in the in the uh, uh, we 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 established learning up in a mini mini watershed not not the mm. entire catchment area of a sluice gate so mm. i wanted to uh, in, i and if there is funding is available i wanted to do that uh, within the catchment area of a sluice gate entire catchment area Mm. So that the so that see the complexity and the benefits uh, going to uh, benefits and that uh, uh, water management because the water management you know is done by the Bangladesh Water Development Board yes. and then agriculture is done by the DF, Department of Agriculture Extension yes. so there is no communication the water yes. management groups are there but they are not yes. very much active but I am not worried about that uh, water management group if we bring the farmers together within the catchment of the sluice gate. On leadership will come and then uh, operate this lease gate. Hmm. So I, I we use the water management association, uh, water management group and association to operate this. Since uh, BWD has formed and there is, uh, you know about Blue Gold Project, Exam Project, hmm. they have the formed this. So I want to capitalize the, those and then revitalize those. The, so that if they, they found that this is interesting, uh, very profitable, then they, they may uh, voluntarily come. Hmm. So, <coughs> sorry. So, 
if there is uh, funding available, I want to go for a polar scale demonstration of mm. this improved uh, natural based solution and see what is the impact in the in, in polar scale. And, yeah. and, and to show that the uh, the policy pillar makers, extension workers, okay, this simple intervention, you need not to invest on much, only to mm. uh, intervene on the water management. Uh, that will give, give, give us productivity uh, improvement option in the coastal zone. I mm. predicted on that if uh, out of 3 million hectare coastal zone, if one third of this area we can bring under this uh, production system with improved water management, that is 1 million hectare, in the waste zone we can get 2 million tons of paddy. Mm. And if we can go for sunflower cultivation in the waste season in 1 million hectare, we can import our oil requirement by 40%. We can mm. reduce the uh, oil import. So this is a great um, uh, opportunity, but I cannot prove it with a small area, uh, mm. 10, 20 factor area. So need to uh, scale it in a large area. That, that is my dream. I could yeah. not find money uh, to do that. <laughs> yeah. And OK, um, I think that's very interesting because indeed the scaling is always uh, uh, a way of proving concept, right? That's um, and do you also, uh, yeah, so you were also talking about earlier about the uh, um, the mixed system to deal with salinity. So I'm talking about neat crops mix mixing with aquaculture and mixed with vegetables. How, uh, did you already test that or how does such a system look like? Or Yeah, we have tested that in the field, but I, I, I did not uh, include that in the presentation mm -hmm. and also, also in the home estate. Uh, but in a limited scale. Uh, yeah. So, but uh, integration of uh, integration, we, we integrated fodder also, not only vegetables, okay. for the livestock community. And then develop a model, uh, like in harvesting, I did not mention here, that we develop wife husband model uh, uh, involving the resource poor women and youth who are uh, uh, doing manual labor in the field, harvesting mm -hmm. the paddy. And then uh, for, the, uh, for the livestock, uh, fodder and the fodder choppers, and that is one of the uh, another model. Uh, the poorers for the, using the chopper uh, provide the service to the community for chopping the fodder. Uh, mm -hmm. Similarly, with a rice hauler, a small rice mill, uh, that Bandari uh, helps us in 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 giving that machine, and we are using that for uh, the model uh, with the poorest group. So vegetables, uh, then uh, fodder. And, uh, and then field crops. Hmm. We are we are we are uh, doing, but in a limited scale, other things. In uh, hmm. field crops are in a larger scale. Yeah, clear. Please, Paul Christiansen, go ahead. Thanks very much for the talk. Just your mention of uh, fodder got me interested. Um, I've been working on a project down in the Mekong Delta, so similar, really similar conditions, similar challenges. Um, that project started out with the basis was salinity. It didn't take long to realise that, in fact, drought was a bit of an issue. And now I'm hearing that the water logging is a big issue too. So there's, it's, um, I think it's, you know, depending on where you are, the seasons and so on, it's it's all of those. My, my work has been looking at mainly vegetables. So we're looking at crop diversification in the dry season, um, mainly vegetables. But I was also interested in fodder as well, because the livestock production can be um, especially small scale livestock production can be fairly profitable for for some of the small holders. So that's that's been interesting. Um, I've got a couple of questions. One is what what sort of species were you growing in terms of fodder? Um, and also, if for our, our situation, we were talking about one season, one out of like a triple rice situation, but substituting the rice. Um, Fodder would need to be produced all year round. So that was sort of a, a slight problem is, oh, we might grow fodder for one season, but what, what do the cows eat for the other two seasons? Um, so can you talk a bit about that seasonality? But what species and seasonality? Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Paul. A very interesting question and you're sharing your experience in the Mekong Delta. Uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, Bangladesh is a very densely populated country. So in the dry, in the wet season, people all like grow for rice. This is our staple. So there is no land in the main field to go for other crops other than fish in the water. But uh, we we did fodder cult cultivation in the dry season because most many of the lands remain fallow. 
So uh, we try to utilize that fallow land uh, for diversifying crops and including the fodder. So in, in terms of fodder species, we utilize barley, triticale, maize, sorghum, uh, foxtail millet, and prosu millet. And we found that the, although the growth of uh, uh, maize is much more biomass than other, other fodder crops, because we grow under the infant environment, so uh, we did not get much yield. Uh, uh, but uh, we found that the um, uh, hybrid or crossbreed livestock, they can eat maize very nicely, even with, uh, without chopping. But the local breed is very poor health. It's very difficult for the, them to, to, to chew that. So they, they mostly like the millets, foxtail millet and prosu, and sorghum also, mm -hmm. they like. Mm -hmm. We did the uh, palatability test. Uh, so oh, yeah. we found, yeah. Yeah. And what, and that, the, uh, thanks for that. Oh, we found with, there was um, one group that was doing baby corn. So this was an already running enterprise. They were doing baby corn, four crops per year of baby corn, selling that to a company for freezing and processing and exporting. So it was, so the, with four crops of baby corn per year, they were getting a lot of residue. So they, you know, it was quite good for the small houses to have, you know, two or three or four cows to fatten. Um, what about the season issue? It, like if you just it, would, how do you keep the fodder going all year round? To, to... our fodder is uh, what we are doing is is the only dry season, huh? yeah. spanning from January to May. Hmm. So uh, I, and 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 we did it in a very limited scale. So it was not fully satisfied the requirement feeding the feed requirement of the of the of the owner who did it because we did it in a limited scale. But we found that. Yes, uh, uh, that if year round fodder can be grown, uh, that is year round can be grown near the in the homestead areas. I I told earlier that the limited land uh, um, can be spared for fodder during winter, uh, during rainy season, monsoon season. We need rice, uh, mm -hmm. so nobody wants mm -hmm. to keep let land fallow or any other crop uh, yeah. in the monsoon. Sure, sure. But and also but fodder fodder is very important. I found that. One of our service provider, who is a landless lady who, who work with the uh, uh, is harvesting paddy by machine, she uh, she developed a, um, a livestock rearing facilities uh, uh, by earning the earning some, and that lady she purchases fodder because she has no land, she cannot grow mm -hmm. anywhere, so she purchases. So that means the fodder is highly demanding. Uh, but from where we find the land to to manage this fodder? That's a critical question. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Thank and and just sort of one more question. I'm assuming beef cattle here, but uh, what is what livestock are, we, are you talking about? I was assuming beef. There's a little tiny bit of dairy cattle, I suppose. But um, what are you are you talking about beef as well or? It's, it's dairy cattle. It's dairy for yeah, milking, okay. milking milk purpose. Yeah, right, right. Okay. Yep. All right. Very good. Nice to have a chat. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and. Dr. Manjaran, what, what do they eat in the dry seasons, the livestock? Mostly mostly the uh, uh, rice straw. Okay. It, it is piled uh, uh, after harvesting, after finishing, it is piled uh, in, a, in, in a round shape type of thing, oval shape. And if there's rainfall, it is it, followed, it, it is painted in the, in, the, uh, in the hump. And then the year round, uh, they use that for the cattle. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, does anyone else have a question? Umnat, do you also happen to have a question? Yeah, <clears throat> although I'm familiar uh, with his work, uh, but uh, I think I'll take the opportunity to ask uh, one question. So, Dr. Mondal, you said uh, that uh, drainage uh, is the major uh, driver for agriculture transformation in the South and we can uh, make a major change uh, in the southern uh, southern uh, region, especially for the dry season crops. Uh, if that's the case, so what's the main constraint uh, that's uh, hindering for this to happen? And what needs to be done to, to achieve that one? So based on your experience, uh, nice. can you tell? Uh -huh. It's very good and very interesting question. And they, for that, I am working for 
long and I'm still hoping to work. The, because we, I, I mentioned it earlier that if you ask anybody, what is the main challenge of agriculture development in the coastal zone? People will say salinity. And all our effort diverted towards salinity. So because of this inappropriate or unrealistic hypothesis, that salinity is our main problem, we could not focus on water issues. Salinity is a problem. I am not telling that salinity is, is not a problem for crop, but salinity is a secondary problem. The first one is the excess water. If we uh, and excess water not in the dry season only, in the wet season. If you cannot drain the land in the wet season, then you cannot cultivate a high yielding variety of rice. And then high yielding variety and low yielding variety yield ton is around two tons per hectare. So a wet season uh, production is low. And again, that high, uh, tradition variety is longer duration. So it pushed the dry season crop towards the unsafe zone. So for, for safe harvest, uh, safe intense, sustainable intensity, you have to introduce high yielding variety in the wet season. And without drainage, you cannot do that in majority of the areas. Yes, there are some high land area, around 40-50% land are growing to high yielding varieties in the coastal zone. Where the, because polder is a saucer shape. So upper portion relatively drain faster than the lower portion. But there is opportunity to drain by using the uh, tidal dynamics. Every day, there is low tide twice, and it goes one meter below the land surface. So drainage is possible by gravity in majority of the land, but there are some lands cannot be drained because of the low deep pressure. So we can we can say around 10, 15 percent of the air cannot be drained by gravity, and that cannot be grown also high yielding variety in the wet season. You have to go for traditional varieties in that area. Yeah, okay. So the, my another question, you said uh, salinity is not a major problem, but uh, uh, this drainage will, after drainage, uh, you need to plant the dry season crop. And uh, this crop will work only when there is uh, low salinity or the no, sal no salinity. Uh, what uh, what happens uh, if there is salinity and you complete the drainage and you have uh, that uh, solution in terms of drainage and uh, uh, the short duration variety in the wet season? But after doing that, if there is salinity in the dry season, then how, how do you manage that one? Because you said salinity is not an issue. Okay, thank you. I said that salinity is not a major problem, it's a problem. And uh, you, uh, you have seen that our productivity in the dry season is low. The reason is that the, the salinity, drought, and water logging, these three are combined. Either they come uh, in, a, in a series, in one, one season, or anyone can happen. And in some year, I showed you that there are rainfall, and if rainfall is almost evenly distributed, then they could provide some irrigation effect. Still, you will not get a yield uh, uh, as as we op, uh, obtain in the other parts of Bangladesh, like in the northern part, because of the salinity. So I tell you, I said that, that the water logging damages the crop and salinity reduces the yield. It's the problem. But if we cannot target the wet season, uh, uh, going for a high yielding variety, then our uh, dry season crop will be affected by both salinity and water logging. But in the dry season, water logging can be avoided if we can manage the uh, uh, water in the wet season and go for a yielding variety. Uh, in terms of uh, tackling salinity, uh, uh, recently, uh, last year, we also uh, did some work with nano fertilizer, nano urea and nano dab. Uh, we, we found some uh, effect of nano dab on increasing productivity because, uh, uh, and then there is a bio fertilizer that developed by the Dhaka University. We are working with them, uh, and we uh, the hypothesis, uh, the, uh, the finding is that this uh, bio fertilizer, when applied to the with the mixing with the chemical fertilizer, it uh, it uh, creates a better environment for the root to uptake nutrients. So we are working on that to address the salinity. But I believe you cannot achieve full potential uh, of dry soil productivity. Salinity is a challenge.
But, oh, so sorry. But if you have good quality irrigation water, if you can apply one or two irrigation water, the top soil salinity uh, reduces 50%. So that's why when there is rainfall, the, the crop yield is better. The, it it uh, leads down the salt below the root zone. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I'm also looking if every, anyone else has some questions or reflections. Otherwise, we go towards the closing of the webinar. Mm. No. Okay, if you still have questions, please feel free to email us and then uh, we get back to you. So, Thank you so much for this very interesting presentation. We learned a lot today. We learned that, uh, the, that the food security and the food productivity can be increased in the coastal zone by applying uh, various of measures, including also the, the drainage as highlighted. And that we also see that, um, that, that salinity and drought are linked. And um, and that we also learned that that there uh, the salinity is mostly a dry season problem, and that the wet season is very low in salinity, and um, that there are several management practices to deal with that. Um, for now, I would like to thank Dr. Manjuran Mundal for this very interesting pres presentation. And also, I would like to announce that the next webinar talk is on the 11th of December which will be uh, about the upstream and downstream connections, so the upstream impacts and the downstream effects. And that will be given by uh, my close colleagues uh, from Wageningen, so Dr. Angel de, uh, Dr. Angel de, de Miguel de Garcia and Marijn Gulpen. So I would very much like to welcome, and, uh, welcome you there. And, um, yeah, looking forward to more discussions and uh, very happy that we can discuss all these interesting topics together and learn together. So for now, I would like to wish you uh, good afternoon, good evening and good morning and uh, hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Give me a second, Doctor. You did.